accessed the podcast of OA, located deep within Sector 14845, and powered by the Emerald Light of Will. The podcast of OA is your guide to the Green Lantern universe. Hosted by Lantern Myron Rumsey, the podcast of OA begins now. Welcome fellow Owens to episode number 209 of the podcast of OA. This episode we've got to be talking about Green Lantern number 12 and Discovery's recent takeover of DC Entertainment and all things Warner Brothers and what does that mean for our favorite comics. By my side virtually across the internet is my good friend Phil Bova. Phil my friend, uh, how are you feeling about talking about uh, some Green Lantern books? Well... It's twelve issues we're putting to rest, so there's lots to, there's lots to say, but um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I I'll, I'll get into it when we get into the issue, you know. But uh, looking forward to it. I mean, at least we got some good news tonight, so there's there's always that. So that's right, that's right. So uh, yeah. so we've yeah we got a little bit to talk about, and, and as before, as always, before we get into talking about the comics and stuff, we want to talk a little bit about what's going on around us in the uh, the world of Green Lantern, and or should I say the universe of Green Lantern. And there's just a few stories out there right now. I mean, DC's in the midst of the round robin. We're down to the last four books, and two of them are Green Lantern related. You've got the Green Lantern, the end of the light at the end of forever, or the light at the end of forever, that is the John Stewart in the future story. And then you've got a Kid Flash story called The Spirit of Fear. Uh, a little disappointed to see that the Alan Scott story didn't make it. How about you? Yeah, I, I I just felt like that where they were going with that, I felt like there was a lot of exploration they could have done uh, to bring Alan Scott's character more into the mainstream, primarily because, you know, and I'd said this on Twitter the other day with somebody and I'm not sure who it was. But, you know, my argument was, you know, since since we've already established the fact that Alan Scott's a homosexual character for the DC universe, uh, what better part to do that in is telling that story arc through World War Two. And you could coincidentally, you know, show the struggles that he had to endure to go through uh, by being homosexual during that time frame, you know, which was no easy task, especially in the military, in the military, um, or if he was in the military, I'm not sure. I think that one was the military, but he like some kind of alien UFO kind of thing. Yeah, it was tied into the UFO craze of yeah. the 40s and 50s. And uh, I, that was what was the hook for me is I'm really interested in the UFO angle and how that would have yeah. played out. And I think that would have been. I think it would have been good. I mean, but again, it's just, it's this ridiculous round robin thing, and I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think very highly of it. I just, I think it's a disservice to fans. I don't, I don't buy into the whole voting process. And you know, to be quite honest with you, I voted for the Alan Scott one, and that's the only one I voted for. And I didn't vote for the other two or the other Lantern books or anything else on there because I just. I have a hard time buying the concept that they're trying to sell me just because I think DC has tarnished their image a lot. And I don't put a lot of stock and faith into what they do. I mean, I just, it's a frivolous, it's a frivolous round Robin thing. And, it, and I think it, I think it exploits these writers and, and these artists, but it doesn't, it, it doesn't give the fans much. I mean, these guys were already paid some, I heard these guys were paid something for their, for whatever they they've done. But I mean, that doesn't do us fans any good. We'd I would pay these individuals for a book myself. I mean, I would gladly call them up and say, "Hey, have you written this? Is it? Can it, can I read it? Here, here's a book. I'll pay you ten bucks for it." You know. But again, this what this round robin's all about, and it's just to me, it's kind of sad, really. Yeah, I've, I've heard some things online about some of the creators not being too happy about the whole process to begin with. Uh, but then, you know, they, they did say they were paid for their pitches and the work that sure. was done initially, which is good. But, you know, like you, like you said, it, it really kind of puts the fans, it pits them against each other, which is not really a great idea. I, I, I personally wish they would go back to the showcase model and, you know, have have uh, people do their pitch and do a three issue 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 pitch and see if it sticks. Well, and not only that, at this at this point in time, you have this content that are involved in this round robin and and last year's. You could publish <laughs> a showcase book every week featuring three stories from all these titles, and still have room f to for growth. Right. Right. I mean that that could be a weekly book, a, a weekly book with three with uh, three different stories in it. So you got 
the first little story of a Green Lantern, and the second story is somebody else, and the third story is somebody else. And then the next showcase book, the continuations. Right. I think anthologies are, are very popular right now. Yeah, I just, I don't know, man. DC does a lot of, I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> 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 so uh it's been 12 years since blackest night and there's still things happening with blackest night from a merchandising perspective uh one of the things is uh i don't know whether you've been buying any of the todd mcfarlane dc multiverse figures but they recently uh, announced a blackest night batman which i know a it's a batman figure that's a problem for us but uh to me it teases the fact that maybe we're going to get a blackest night wave well and you know when you <laughs> I know we went back and forth on your Instagram about it, which is kind of fun. But my question, here's my question about it. They always cash, they, they cash in on Blackest Night and it's not even, a, the, the story arc wasn't even about Batman. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, and they're cashing in on his, on, on the Blackest Night, the Blackest Night. Keep in mind, that's the key word there. And they're cashing in on it because it's Batman. And it's like, really? It's not even his, any, it's not even his, his story. It yeah. wasn't his book. It wasn't even his book for crying out loud. He was kind of a background character in it. But guess uh, what, man? It sells. It's going to sell. I, I'm what I'm hoping is that it was just a tease, and we're going to get more Blackest Night figures. And if if Batman was just the way they want to tease it and you start some interest, I'm okay with that. But if that's yeah. going to be the only Blackest Night figure, I will be severely disappointed. Yeah, because it'll go back to what I said. It is cool looking. I'm not going to. I'm not going to lie. For all you Batman fans out there, check it out. It's 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 awesome. It's not necessarily the one I would have done, though. I would have done the one where, uh, uh, oh gosh, who was that that was licking Batman's skull? Wasn't that Black Hand? Or Black Hand. I would have done that one. Yeah. Yeah. That would have been a cool one. Anyway, uh, so, but it's, it's going to be, it's going to sell. And it's, and as far as McFarlane toys go, that's a little out of my price range. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is, we've talked about it before, World's Finest is doing a Blackest Night themed box. They do these blind box subscriptions. And it's interesting for a blind box, they've revealed five of the items so far that are in the blind box. I like what's what's left to surprise anybody with. Uh, but so far they've done, they've announced a Blackest Night wall scroll. Then they showed pictures of a Blackest Night t-shirt. Then they showed a picture of an Atrocitus vinyl figure. And just today... They released a picture showing a Green Lantern koozie with matching emotional spectrum coasters. That's pretty awesome. You got the last one in there. Didn't you just get the last one that day? Uh, they they haven't done. I did the Green Lantern box when they did it, and I was severely disappointed. Right, right, uh, right. And I haven't done one since. Uh, but this one I'm gonna I'm gonna buy just because I want I want to give them a second chance to redeem themselves a little bit. Uh, I, I'm not sure how I feel about the koozie. I'm not a big beer bottle drinker. And when I drink be out of beer, I don't drink it out of the bottle. So I'm hoping I can find a water bottle that fits in the koozie, but we'll see. And I, <laughs> I, I hope the, uh, the, the coasters aren't cardboard with printed stuff that's just going to come off the first time you use it anyway. Right. But we'll see. We'll see. And uh, the other thing going on right now is Young Justice is doing episodes uh, on the HBO Max platform. They come out every Thursday and they recently released a promo image for the the next arc, which just started today. And it is a new gods focused arc. And in the artwork, uh, you can see what is either Tomar Ray or Tomar two could be either one. And there was a line in the episode right before this one that just came out this week, the app last week's episode, there was a line where, um, Aaron, they were doing a thing with, 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 um, Atlantis. And Oren was was leaving. He, he he stepped down as the leader of Atlantis for Merrick to take over. And he made a comment about going back to the Justice League. And Aqualad said, uh, "I you know I'll, I'll step my position back as Aquaman on the League." And he said, "Well, if there's four Green Lanterns and this many of this and this many of that, then there's room for two Aquaman." And uh, he said, four Green Lanterns." Well, we've only seen Hal, John, and Guy in the Justice League in Young Justice. So was that a slip-up, or are we going to see another member of the Justice League who's a Green Lantern? Could it be Kyle? Could it be Jessica? Who knows? Is this the fourth season? I think so. I think it's the fourth season. But they've been kind of breaking it up into story arcs, and I know COVID really affected production a little bit, so they've been kind of releasing them a little at a time. 
Uh, but yeah, they're they're up to the the next story arc, and it and it looks. I haven't watched the episode all the way through yet. I I kind of skimmed it to see if there was a Green Lantern in it before we recorded tonight, uh, just so if there was, we could talk about it. And there wasn't anything in this first episode, but I'll have to go back and watch it. I did see Orion and Dark Side and High Father in it, and Light Ray, and so on. So I, I'm looking forward to it because I love the new gods. Yeah, the new gods are always cool, and they're really they really work well with the Green Lantern Corps. Yeah, so I'm interested in seeing how Young Justice ties into that. Uh, I, I have been watching Young Justice, but I'm, I'm a number of episodes back behind, so I got to kind of watch. Uh, I got to do some binge watching to get caught up a little bit. Good idea. All right, well, my friend, we've got some things to talk about, so why don't we uh, take a break and we can do a Know Your Course segment, and then we'll come back and talk about Green Lantern number twelve. Sounds great, man. Listen up, all you white circles. This is Drill Instructor Kilowog, and you're listening to the podcast of Oa. And don't you forget it, boozers. <clears throat> Hello, fellow Owens, and welcome back to another Know Your Core segment. This week, we have a shamefully short one, a one-off, a Delica, appeared in one issue Green Lantern, Emerald Warriors, her only appearance. Adelica and her partner Vagar were killed by the monster Gigor on its rampage towards Oa. Adelica was slowly digested by the monster, who fed off the energy of the Green Lantern rings. She was sparred further, excuse me, she was spared further, suffering when the monster was destroyed by Guy Gardner and the Lantern Theodoric. She, her one and only appearance was in Emerald Warriors issue number one. And there you have it. Another Know Your Course segment coming at you live straight to you fellow Owens. Well, Phil, we're here at the end of the Jeff Thorne run. And the only things we really know right now is that this is the last issue of this run. Uh, we do not know if Jeff Thorne is writing more. According to Jeff Thorne on social media today, he has said that uh, this was meant to be a trilogy. And they only bought him for the first part of the trilogy, the first book. It's broken down into 36 chapters, three different books. So we'll see uh, when things happen. He kind of gave the impression that we wouldn't know what's going on or that he wouldn't know what's going on until after Dark Crisis is over with. So who knows? Who knows? But I got a, I got a question on that. I mean, <laughs> why do you... Granted... Well, okay, so that must mean one of two things. That must mean that the events of Dark... The events that spin out of Dark Crisis will impact the writing moving forward for certain characters, I bet. I mean, that would be the only way, right? Because you know, you know as well as I do that they've already planned this out for an extended period, right? So they got a plan, somewhat a plan. We hope. <laughs> well, it, but what I'm saying is it isn't like dark crisis one and two, because they've already, they've already shown snippets from number two. Now, um, you know, those issues have already been written and are moving forward. So, you know, they, Theoretically, should have three and four out there, right? Right, right. You, you I, hope, how, yeah. I mean, how many is it supposed to be? Did they even say? Uh, I, I think it's six. You see, there's six issues or eight issues, if I recall. I mean, so that's, you know, six, seven months worth of, eight months worth of, of stuff. So, and then you got to take it, keep in mind, I'm sure the, all the other books are tying in in some fashion or another, or? I, I, I don't know. It's interesting because other characters have books that are ongoing, and they're yeah. not stopping. And but in the case of Green Lantern, it, it's hard to say. So when we get to the end, of, when we get to the end of talking about this particular issue, there's there's something at the end of the issue that alludes to that there's more coming. But either Jeff Thorne is being nebulous on purpose because he has to be, or he truly doesn't know if he's continuing in the series. I'm not sure which it is. You would think that based on what the book says, you would get the impression that he's going to be writing the next section of this trilogy that he's got in mind but i don't know it's, it's funny because he says he says online that uh he has big plans for kyle and guy and even hal so 
who know who knows what's going to happen there. I, I guess time will tell. I think we're we're a day or two out from uh, seeing solicitations for July. So hopefully, you know, hopefully we're going to see something. But to, to circle back to this particular issue, this is kind of the conclusion. There, there's not a whole lot. I don't want to say there's a whole lot of story going on per se, but this is a lot of wrap up. It's a lot of tying together not all the loose ends that we've had unraveled and created throughout this run. But wrapping up some of the loose ends and leaving some other things very, very out there and unknown. I'd agree with that because this one is basically just a narrative between Stuart and the source wall or that source. Yeah, for the most part, we find out what kind of happens a little bit with uh, with the Green Lantern. So the cover, uh, as, as usual on most comics these days, the cover has really not much to do with what's going on on the inside of the book uh, other than being a, a, a picture of the Green Lantern Corps with Jenna Stewart in his new outfit. Uh, there that's about it but yeah as you, as you said a lot of this starts out with john and the source wall mm -hmm. or i shouldn't say the source wall but the source and he's dealing with the god storm and you see all the energies and there's some visual clues right off the bat that <clears throat> the energies that you're seeing there are primarily violet green and blue and variations like you see some yellow and stuff mixed in there but uh, very colorful very emotional spectrum -y, uh kirby crackle dots it is cool looking <clears throat> And very psychedelic uh, man, yeah, yeah, I, I, I very, very psychedelic, uh, just, just literally crackling with energy. And John, uh, is trying to do something like he's trying to create some kind of a chance or an opportunity for the Green Lanterns on Oa. And then he has a conversation with the Source Wall, and the Source Wall looks very, very much like Jack Kirby, which, of course, is on purpose for the nod, yeah, yeah, it's for the for nod. The and for the win. It, 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 he makes a reference to Terry Pratchett. Uh, he talks about how he was once once a turtle, which is a very Terry Pratchett thing. Mm, very cool. And I thought, you know, some people are like, well, that's such a cool thing. That's so creative. But, I mean, Marvel did the same thing months ago in the Fantastic Four where Jack Kirby was their all-knowing, all-seeing character. I, I, I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I love a nod to Jack Kirby anytime you see it. But then I, I sit back and think, well, you know, it, it comes off like another retread because somebody else has already done it first. And Jack, while he did a lot of work when it comes to the new gods, he wasn't really the same architect for DC that he was for Marvel. I almost would have preferred if he had done something like a Gardner Fox or, or even better, a Julie Schwartz. Uh, that would have been, that would have been, that would have been cool. Because those are two guys who really don't get the creative credit and the accolades they should get. Or Martin Nodell. Yeah, yeah. If you're going, if you're going to do a Green Lantern only thing, yeah. Um, there you go. Pay homage to it to, to, to the first one. I, I really, you know, I really, uh, I really feel like Julie Schwartz really gets the short end of the stick because he, he's the one that was the one behind bringing back a lot of these characters after the Age of the Innocents or Seduction of the Innocents, and he inadvertently led to Stan Lee feeling like he could do superhero comics. Yeah. He kind of saved both universes at the end of the day, but uh, it is what it is. And it was interesting to have a, have a human representation of the source wall uh, to have John have somebody to talk to because this whole part of the story needed to have somebody for him to interact with. Otherwise, it would have been really bad. It would have, yeah, just it would have been slow with just the, the the voiceover, I guess you would call it, or the 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 box over. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. Just narration boxes would wouldn't do it, and, and thought bubbles, I guess, are are out of vogue. So, how do you how do you get the story out there? But the uh, the source tells John, you know, this isn't really going to work. What are you trying to do? And so on and so forth. And then we cut back over to Oa. We see a little bit more about what's been going on there. We see that you know Simon is alive and Joe's alive, and, and so on. And, and how's there? And and they realize well John is gone so they assume that John is is destroyed that John is dead, um, the guardians are nowhere to be found. And then this glowing orb thing, kind of there's waves of energy coming out of it and it's doing things and it's actually repairing all of the damage on Oa that was done in this massive fight with Koyos. Everywhere, even all the ships because they go around that ship's deck. And they talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. Everything is kind of being reset to brand new. And, I mean, Simon even makes a, a quip about the uh, the Green Lantern Iron Man outfits having the new car smell. 
<laughs> oh, that's Simon. He's such a jokester. <laughs> well, and then there's this encasing around this, this what Hal calls a beacon. And it's interesting because, again, if you look at the beacon, the energies that are in it are green and purple and blue and and so on. <clears throat> but, uh, <coughs> excuse me. But then Hal starts to feel something coming out of this beacon. And Hal, everybody thinks that it's, you know, Hal's a little punch truck because of the damage of the fight. But the next thing you know, Hal's there with a power ring and his Silver Age costume, complete with the old swing trunks. That he's been kind of rebooted. And he even says, well, the ring feels like his original ring. Not the one that was charged off the Cosmic Grail. Not the one he forged out of his own will. But his original Abinsur ring. Which is very interesting. Yeah, that is. At least, it, But at least at least it was enough to keep that in the, in the story thread. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, so that's good that they decided to do that. Because, I mean, as this Lantern fans know that Hal's got a unique ring. Well, I mean, they, all of them are unique. But, I mean, Hal's one of the main Lanterns. So when you say unique with Hal, that means it's unique with everything. Right. And and what Thorne has said is that he's trying to reset things so that there are no special rings. There's no special any of the stuff. That they're all the same. Good. Which I, I'm not sure I, I 100% agree with that, but I'm fine with the ring doing that. And as he kind of rallies the troops to go and, hey, what, let's find all those rings we had and all the Green Lanterns that are here on Oa, and let's go to the source and see if we can manifest something. And so the Flash goes and gets the rings and all of the Green Lanterns go to the edge of the, the beacon up on the podium and they all get their rings and he leads them in the oath and there's this big... Um, swash of energy that goes out and suddenly they're back with their their original silver age design uniforms even joe Mullane has a version of a silver age outfit on yeah it's pretty cool looking i like i like that kick but that throwback and uh and and what we find out is her ring is no longer special either so she does not have her special ring from far sector anymore she has this the plain old regular green lantern issue ring uh, and we see her at one point change her uniform. And it isn't that she's got her, her old ring back, but, you know, you can use your ring to change your outfit. And I'm sure we'll see Hal in his newer version of his uniform down the road. But what happens that's different is not everybody gets a ring back and not everybody gets a Green Lantern ring back. Iolande is now a Star Sapphire and Badge is now a Blue Lantern, which is a very interesting development. Yeah, so if you're gonna throw those kind of nuggets in there, that means you that means you gotta you have you have to commit to this. You know what I mean? Don't right. so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna say that I, I don't know I don't know him as a writer as well. I mean, let's put it this way. I've I've known him for what he's written for the twelve issues that I've read so far. And I'll say that I I like when writers do stuff like this, don't get me wrong, but I don't like being duped when it's done. You know, don't give me a, a dead end. Don't throw these characters into the spotlight like this and us Lantern fans pick that out. And then another year to, or down the line, you're like, you don't hear, well, what was the point of that? Right, right, you right. Know, do something with it and then impress me with doing something with it. Right, what's the purpose of behind it? I mean, we know yeah. that we, we know that Maltus is destroyed. We know that Zamoran is destroyed. Odom is destroyed. Um, the Helix is destroyed. That was the controller's building, their, their planet, their headquarters. That's been destroyed. And what we come to discover is that this beacon can charge all of their rings. Not only can it do that, but it can decide what ring you're going to get, which is inter- which is which is different. I, and I'm not sure I I'm not sure I like the fact that we are merging all of them to have to be in the same planet together. Because to me, what I liked about the different parts of the core, the different cores, was how they were different and how they complemented each other. So I don't want to see them necessarily side by side. And the difference between a blue and a green lantern is, you know, the the whole thing behind the Jeff Johns emotional spectrum dynamic was the closer to the center of the spectrum you are, the more you're controlling the, the emotion. The further away from the center that you are, the more the emotion can be in control of you, which is why red and being rage on the left and love being violet on the right, mm-hmm. those those are two very strong emotions. And you're not necessarily in control of yourself. So Ayalande, and I, 
I don't know whether I agree with Ayalande being a star sapphire. I think it was just convenient to, hey, here's a female character. I don't know what to do with. I'm going to make her uh, a star sapphire. I, maybe there's more thought behind it, but there's nothing here that gives us any of that stuff to, to help us. I thought that would be cool if they did Joe Mullane. Yeah, that could have been interesting. Uh, and, and, and poor Simon doesn't get a ring. He doesn't. But he gets a new outfit when he then he then he get that when he starts talking to all the dead lanterns or whatever it is yep so all the rings come up uh, the rings that didn't go to anybody come up and all of a sudden you see all of these I, i'm going to say they're the equivalent to a green lantern force ghost and simon baz refers to at least as cole and jinko sin and a green lantern named desire who we never saw before to my knowledge and arishia and Arishia, yep. And and they're basically all force ghosts of some sort. And um, we don't know what this role is, and and, and Simon gets the, a new outfit that looks very much like John's. Uh, we don't really understand what this role is yet. Again, this is this is a, a new plot thread, a new hanging plot thread that gets created in this, this issue. And we have to assume that all the Green Lanterns that we saw die throughout this run are now included in these force ghosts. So... You know, included with all of these is not only these guys, but Amanita who died. Um, let's see who else died in this one because there's there was quite a few. Um, Amanita, RRU92, Ashpack Glyph, uh, Matt Colloy, a, a bunch of them. So we're assuming that that's the case. We don't see them here, they're not referred to, but you have to assume that they are all included in this whole pseudo resurrection thing which i thought was funny because one of the things that jeff thorne had made a big point over was if they die they die and yeah. and yeah their bodies are gone but they're not quite dead now are they so don't know if that was an editorial mandate or whether him not knowing where this is going to go or if he's going to get to continue he needed to leave some loopholes for other creators to be able to bring him back if that's what they want to do i don't know I mean, I, we know that. Well, we, we know something's going to happen with Simon Baz moving forward. Then, yeah, it looks like he's he's basically in. in uh, Thorn kind of alluded to it today on a, on a message board that he's essentially a a Simon Baz is essentially a new version of a crypt keeper of sorts. Oh wow! But then he's going to have some abilities that tie back to his original story. So maybe he's going to have a healing factor. Maybe he can he can bring them back from the dead over time. I I, I don't know. Uh, but it's interesting, uh, I guess. I guess. Uh, but it, it uh, what what this run has done is it's it's moved. J- John is no longer a Green Lantern. Kyle is missing in action, and so is Guy. So we don't know. We we kind of know where where they are, but we don't know if they're okay because we yeah. haven't seen them in quite a while. Uh, you've got Simon, who's no longer really a Green Lantern. So and Jessica's a Yellow Lantern. Kelly Quintella is still in a coma. So the without only, the gauntlet. Without the gauntlet. The gauntlet's gone, yep. So it only leaves Hal and Joe Mullane as the only two Green Lanterns on Earth from our sector. That's a pretty cool pair up, though. Yeah, it, it could be an interesting duo. I, I, I can totally see that. Because you know she's not going to put up with his crap. <laughs> and he's not going to put up with hers. No, and so <laughs> they, would, they would really work well off one another. It, it, could be, it could be very interesting if, if that's what they do. I, you know, It's hard to say. Well, will Hal do a Green Lantern book and will she be in Justice League? Who knows? You know, again, we don't really know, especially with Dark Crisis coming up, how things are going to shake out when the, when the dust settles. Hey, I do want to say I think my favorite page in this book was the, uh, the Aha Take On Me page. Dun, 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 That's all I was thinking about when that when those panels came up. <laughs> that was well done, and it looks really, really cool on there. So we go we go back to to John and the source, right? And um, it, you know the the thing you and I talked about was you know the, the source is supposedly going to exact a price, and we you and I both talked about how well you know what's going to happen. John is going to sacrifice himself to restart the power batteries, which is exactly what happens. Uh, although we get kind of the uh, the gotcha in that John's tank won't run dry even though he may exhaust all the power he's got it's going to recharge and he really can't die anymore so <laughs> i'm not sure how i feel about that i i i'm of two minds one that a character who can't die and has all this power there's really 
I don't know. I, I find those kind of characters to be terribly uninteresting, but that's just me. I find it a cliche. I mean, it's like, right. Who gives a, you know what? I mean, Superman can't die. Okay. So apparently Batman can't either. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for the record, none of these guys can die, but we all know that the only, the only characters that ever get killed off are the characters that, that, are just the small potatoes that don't matter much. You know what I mean? Right, like the, right. the no name people, like that's, what's easy about the core members, right? I'm just going to, I'm just going to throw a bunch of whatever core members out there that we're going to kill off this week. Okay. We'll throw in this guy. His name is Jagabad Khan or something, you know, just make some <laughs> crap up, but everybody knows that Superman's not going to die. I mean, even with this right. event coming up, I mean, right. I mean, sure. I get the tease. Oh, we got to impress the, Impress the fans that the Justice League is going to die, but us old timers. I mean, I hate to say it, we 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 know the trope. I mean, it's it's been done ad nauseum. I mean, right, right. You know, it's the old "fool me once, shame on you; fool me twice, shame on me." Where, you know, I, I did like I did like visually how they made John. They they didn't color John. They left him a black and white sketch when he was out of juice. Yeah, that was cool. And that I thought cool. that was a nice a nice design choice. Yeah, that was cool. But yeah, I don't like I don't like the the omnipotent omnipotent characters, and I also didn't like the backhanded comments about uh, absolute power corrupting absolutely and using uh, parallax and ion as examples because ion was never corrupted by anything. No, ion that was a good entity. Yeah, and and Hal's parallax wasn't it was that wasn't him using being corrupted by power this was him being in controlled and manipulated if you looked at him as the god of light he he both hal and kyle when they were given those kind of powers and they were in control of those powers they both used them for good just like john says he would do and they both gave up their power to for the greater good Mm -hmm. so i don't like this backhanded comment that somehow uh kyle and hal are are less of a character because of, of being corrupted by power which didn't happen for either one of them uh, at all. I, I just, I don't like the, the whole making crap up to try to elevate a character. I also don't like the fact that one of the things that, that Jeff Thorne said was, well, you know, we can't have people with all these special abilities. They all have to be the same. <laughs> Yet when we get done, they're all the same except for John. Yeah. You're very, <laughs> because apparently now all of a sudden he has ascended. Right. And since he's ascended, he's, I guess, I guess at this point forward, John Stewart is the most ultimate DC character that's out there. Period. That's the way it seems. That's the way it seems. That's what I'm led to believe. It, it's funny because again, on the on the CBR forums, I've been kind of following it interestingly today. When people have questioned things or disagreed with him, he's gotten very passive aggressive with people. Well, yeah, because he can't back up his argument. <laughs> right, right, and it, like somebody said, well, you know, you're elevating John and depowering these other characters. When you said you wanted to make them all the same, and so his re- his rebuttal was, well, he's not a Green Lantern. And the response was, well, he may not be a Green Lantern, but he's still a Green Lantern character. And he got very defensive about, well, you know, no, he's not a Green Lantern. You know, you're 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 changing the goalposts. Yeah. Uh, one person he he uh, he one person responded with some comments about some things that he didn't like and and some creative criticism. And this guy, Jeff Thorne, basically went on and basically tried to tell him why he was wrong, why his opinions were wrong. And it forced this this fan who's had multiple interactions with Jeff Thorne and every time they've been negative to delete his profile and, and leave. That's sad. I mean, so you're going right, to get run off by a writer. Right. Well, and, and I remember, and, and I know even Ethan Van Skyver is a very controversial figure, but I remember when he was having run-ins with fans back during the whole election and people were trying to trying to drag him through the mud and he was trying to defend himself and his family. And DC was like published this whole thing about rules with interacting with fans. And I'm like, w- w- where's this now? Yeah. Because he ran somebody away who, who's got a very now negative feeling about the books and about the writer just because of an interaction when he questioned some of the decision making and didn't understand why certain things were the way they were and voiced their opinion and this guy basically tried to say no you're wrong and debate him about it and it's like you know that's really not that's to me that's why that's one of the reasons why this is not the right guy to lead the franchise 
because well, he, do, he doesn't know how to interact with people. He thinks he's smart. He's the smartest guy in the room. And when anybody dares question him, he gets all passive aggressive. And see, and there's a problem with carrying that stroke of ego when, when, you, when you got a book. And if you've been writing a book, let's say to the tune of Scott Snyder on Batman, you know, I'll use his, him in, as an example. Uh, I'll use another example. Dan, Dan Jurgens on Superman, right? You're entitled to have an in-depth knowledge base on a characterization. I mean, you've been around the block. You've, I mean, look how much Snyder's written Batman. I mean, he read ho- how many issues of that guy. He carried that character for a long time, right? So if you know your characters, you know, like the back of your hand, it, you're entitled to have that kind of thought process and, and have that kind of arrogance. But at the same time, if you are being challenged by a fan, and those comments make sense, it's okay to have a, a shared narrative and have a conversation with it. Not just jump on somebody. It, it's not, it, they're not a troll. You can jump on those and you can just get rid of them. But at the same time, have a conversation with a fan. Right, right. And, and the person was not being trollish in any way, shape, or form. They were just saying, well, you know, he, he, they used, for example, the whole question about, well, if we were making and putting everybody in the same level of playing field, how come we elevated John anyway? That doesn't, that doesn't really accomplish that. Or, Question some things which I, I myself have questions about. I mean, if John is ascended and he's got the power to do all these things, he rep- he chose to repair spaceships instead of bring Kelly Quintella out of a coma. Or <laughs> he's got all those Green Lanterns stuck in the dark sector. Why not just grab them and bring them back? Or let alone bring back all the dead lanterns, period. Right. I mean, why, why are you choosing to use your powers in those ways and overlooking some very obvious things? I mean, why not restore them? Or, or, or if you're going to create something for all of the rings to charge off of, all of those, the, the Star Sapphires and the Blue Lanterns and the Green Lanterns all had a central power battery. Why not at least make it look like a power battery? Why this ball? Yeah, that's that, and you know, and the only person I can answer that is him, and you're not right. going to get a straight answer out of him about that, you know. No, no, he becomes very defensive, you know, because he, because guys like that take ownership over a character, and I, I just don't think that's, I don't think that's right. I mean, I just, you, you got to be a veteran writer of a character to have ownership of that character, and right. and even then, by that stretch of the imagination, it's still not even accurate to say ownership of a character. It, it, but your knowledge base is deep. That's fine. That gives you kind. Of, that gives you your 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 credence to say, well, this is how I envision this. You know, I've been doing this a long time. Blah blah blah. This and that. When you're writing something for twelve issues, you know that is at best what this past year. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I give this entire run maybe a maybe a two, maybe a three, because I don't care about it enough. No, it wasn't entertaining enough. Yeah, so but uh, but I'm also intelligent enough to look at the writing and 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 pick it apart and I, I there's a lot of stuff that he's written over the past 12 issues that I've noticed that that while it doesn't make sense to me, I don't feel like it, it, it's any kind of connection to any knowledge base I have on the Green Lantern universe as a whole, which is why it wouldn't make sense to me, you know, because it's like, well why why this? Why that? Why that doesn't make any sense. And, you know, to me, I feel like he's stripped the Green Lantern of a lot over the past year just to dumb it down by saying, oh, well, the, the battery's destroyed, but not. It was taken apart to a molecular level. But then subsequently, John Stewart's going to come and he's just going to, what, be the Green Lantern power battery himself, basically? I mean, yeah. that's kind of what the higher power is. like. And, and I, I mean, yawn. I don't care about that. That doesn't. Right. That's not an interesting level. I, you can do so much more with John Stewart if you want to elevate him to a new level, not just having him be the power battery or recharging the battery. You could do more. You can do something even better that makes him look like a better character. Right. And at the end of this, basically, we see John uh, rescuing uh, some people from some slaves from slavers, and you see John in an even a, a different outfit, wielding an emerald sword. And he basically refers to himself as the Emerald Knight. Yeah, well, it looks like the sword from that three-issue arc that we uh, didn't we talk about the dragon, the green dragon. Or oh whatever. yeah, yeah, dragon. The yeah, I don't know what the one you're talking about. I think it was a yeah. dragon lord. Yeah, dra- I, don't <clears throat> I don't remember. But uh, that it, looks like the sword that guy had. Yep. 
And it ends with John Stewart and the Emerald Knights will return. So is the Emerald Knights, the re- Green Lantern Corps rebranded, or is the Emerald Knights, the Green Lanterns that are depowered and are stranded in the dark sector? Don't know. Don't know. Well, I don't know. I mean, Emerald Knights has a cool ring to it, but it's not much different than Emerald Warriors when that was written, you know. Right, right. It, it leaves us in a, in a very interesting place because there's no Guardians. So how do the Green Lanterns govern themselves? We still have the United Planets to contend with in that whole thing. Uh, we've got a number of... There's just there's a lot of dangling threads, and I don't get the impression that we know where we're going yet. Or if, if we, if, if DC knows, they're not letting us know, you know, and Jeff Thorne is being uh, definitely nebulous about the whole thing, but we've got a number of green lanterns that are stranded. We know, uh, according to him, there are 600 green lanterns that were on Oa and recharged the rings. So we have 600 green lanterns. There were 500 or so in the dark sector. So that's all the Green Lanterns there are, but those 500 don't really count because they're stuck there. And we do know that time passes differently. That time there, that you know, at one point in this issue, they talk about how a month a month or so has passed here, and it's only been a matter of a few days or so back on Oa. Well, I mean, if it's if we're coming up to Dark Crisis, I mean, maybe that's maybe that's a way to spin in the whole lanterns that are in the dark sector. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's dark, dark. I mean, I mean, but I'll say this. I mean, that's kind of. <laughs> If that ends up being the case, and I'm probably going to laugh if I read it, or if something happens that that I that I know, and I'm just going to be like, "That's the laziest writing ever." <laughs> why, dude? That's <laughs> yeah. I you know I, I for anybody who's who who who's bought every issue of this run, God bless you for investing the money in it. I just don't find it was entertaining enough. I didn't find the storytelling as smart as the writer would like us to think it is, and I just I just thought it was so much a retread of things we've already seen. Over and over and over again. And also, you know, I mean, to each their own when it comes to how they approach this book. I mean, just because I don't like Jeff Thorne's writing, and I don't, and I'm, and I'm not afraid to admit that. That doesn't mean I don't. It, that doesn't mean I don't generally like the guy. I don't know the guy. I don't don't care enough about the guy to to, to really know about him. I, it's, he's another writer. Unless I meet him and get to talk to him, which I know it's never going to happen. I'm never going to get to fully develop a relationship with this individual. So I only have to look at this through one lens. He's a writer on a book of which I have a pretty big knowledge base for. So his writing is, is, is up against a pretty high bar of people that came long before him that have elevated the Green Lanterns to levels that this person that I'm sorry, Thorne, just I don't think he'll, he'll ever do. You know, and you can weave in Dark Crisis in there all you want. And that may help boost uh, the Green Lanterns with the the fandom. But the problem is we still have to con- contend with if Thorne comes back and continues writing some more and where he's going to take it outside of that. Then that just tells me that, well, the Green Lanterns were popular when Dark Crisis hit because everybody was interested in what was going on in that book and that event. But nobody cares about what's happening with Green Lantern. And the next 12 issues that are coming out by Jeff Thorne because of the 12 issues that sucked before it. (laughs) I I don't know. I mean, but everybody likes different writers, you know, and I've heard you and I have expressed many, many times about the difference between a a Grant Morrison type of writer and a a Jeff Thorne and a, and and, I mean, the list goes on and on. I mean, Jeff Johns for that matter. I mean, they're all different, just different writers. And, I, I appreciate everybody all the same, and they like what they like. But I'm going to be honest with you. This this has been 12 issues of nonsense to me, and it held no interest to in me whatsoever. Besides the fact that I was curious about what was going on with with just lanterns in general, just to keep myself in the in the know, so to speak. Right. I but mean, it was I, filling. Right. I, I I had my concerns right from the start. But I tried to approach the book with an open mind, and and then when I read the first few issues, I'm like, no, I, I, I trust should have just trusted my gut. This isn't this isn't a book for me, and seeing how the writer behaves in social media and how he's behaved in forums, and the defensiveness and uh, aggressiveness, I'm like, you know, this isn't a good person. I originally I had thought about inviting him to come on the show very early on to try to address the controversy, but. I was a little cautious because I'm like, well, I don't know if I want to give this person the bandwidth. And I saw him go on other shows. 
and there was a lot of, I don't want to say backpedaling, but it was a lot of spin. And I'm like, you know, I, I really, I, not that, not that we have a huge audience and not that we we are an air quote influencer or any of that kind of crap. Um, I, I just didn't feel comfortable giving him bandwidth and I didn't know if I could carry on a conversation with him and not ask questions that are tougher. And most people, when they come on a show like ours or any other podcast, they're not there to debate. They just, they're there to promote their work. They're, they're giving you their time because they know or they assume that they're going to walk out of it with maybe a larger audience because somebody who listened to your show or your podcast or your YouTube channel is going to tune in and say, oh, maybe I want to read this based on based on your interactions. And I, I wasn't about to promote the book because I didn't think it was that good. Right, and it's and it's and it's a lot different when you when you're talking to somebody who like, like you know when we talk to Liam Sharp, you know, and and you're having this conversation, you know, a lot. Sure, it's Green Lantern related, but a lot of the conversation isn't because you're getting to know the writer or slash the artist uh, more so than you are about the, the the book that they're writing. Period. You know, I don't, and and I think that's more. I think that's more of a benefit to the fans because you you get to hear the stories coming from them and. While I'll, I'll never have the, I, I mean, I can't say I'll never, but while I don't really ever want to have a chance to, to have Jeff Thorne, I just, I don't know what I would want to say to him, you know, and I don't know how I would even start the conversation because it's like, you know, okay, well, can you talk about the 12 issues you just wrote? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know where to begin because I don't, I don't have a lot of knowledge base for him though. You know, Jeff Johns, I did Dan Jurgens and, and, you know, Joshua Williamson and, and, you know, and all these other writers that I can name off the list. Thorne came into this and I had no idea who he was before it. And I didn't even bother to go back and read any of this stuff before and because I wanted to see how well he would handle a character that I have vested interest in. And to, it didn't impress me. I mean, he uh-huh. didn't blow me away. And, and, and. The Grant Morrison, Liam Sharp one blew me away because it, while many may or may not have liked it, it was still really, really deep. And, and it, you were in the trench because you were involved in a Grant Morrison type of book and, and enveloped in this Liam Sharp artwork that was just blowing your mind every day. Well, throughout this whole entire 12 issues, nothing really caught me off guard. Nothing said, man, that was really cool. I mean, nothing said, wow, wow, I've never seen that before. That just blew my mind. I just wasn't impressed. Yeah, and, and visually, you know, just speaking of the artwork, we really didn't talk about the artwork. The artwork in this series, to me, has been hit or miss. I mean, yeah. Marco Santucci, I think his artwork looks great. Tom Rainey's, not so much. And it was different when you had two different arcs and you had two different artists doing the two different arcs. But when you had this particular issue where everything was cutting back and forth throughout the book, Boy, their styles are so starkly different that it made it a harder reading experience mm-hmm. because because the styles are so different. I mean, there are places where Hal Jordan didn't look like Hal Jordan and, and the big heads and it just it, it didn't work for me at all. So that was just a whole other thing. But um, just to end out on, on the whole Jeffrey Thorne thing, you know, when I, when I read a little bit about him and saw some interviews with him, I'm like, you know, this is, this is the kind of guy I could be friends with in real life. Because we have a lot of similar interests, but then as I started to see more, I'm like, no, I, I don't, I don't want to talk to him. And I, <laughs> I, 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 I don't want to get to know him. I don't want any of those things. I think he's a clown. There, I'll be blunt. I don't even think. I don't even interact with him on Twitter that much. I mean, I just, you know, I the Thorn identity, I guess, which is kind of that's kind of cool, clever. Um, but I just kind of scroll past some of the stuff. I've never really, really other than the stories that you told and some of the trolling that I've done on some of the, the chat rooms and everything, I don't really catch anything that he says. So um, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to be sad if he's still writing, like continuing with this book, even though we don't know at this point, but by the looks of it, it kind of appears that way, you know, it's like it's going forward. So I'll just say, ugh, but I hope <laughs> between the time and, now and what we learn later if he does continue to write this i hope there's going to be more to the green lanterns period than just his stuff you know i hope i have something else to to, <laughs> to you know to bounce my brain off of you know i hope so it's, it's hard not having a green lantern book but 
with with that said, that wraps up this run. So you and I are going to take a break, and then we're going to ca- talk about the news that came out just today. Yeah. About the Discovery takeover of Warner Media. Prepare for a spine tingling, nerve shattering podcast featuring all your favorite monsters. You won't believe your ears when you listen to Monster, Monster Kid, Kid Radio. Radio. Hear your host, Derek M. Cook, and his ever rotating stable of guests discuss your favorite classic and sometimes not so classic monster movies. Subscribe to Monster Kid Radio through iTunes or Stitcher, or visit monsterkidradio.net before the next weekly episode of Monster, Monster Kid Radio. Go through the archives for interviews with Sarah Karloff, Victoria Price, and Joel Hodgson. Listen to discussions about movies like Creature from the Black Lagoon, Island of Terror, and King Kong. And don't forget convention coverage from Monster Bash and the HP Lovecraft Film Festival. Classic Monsters. Modern Talk. And the head of Rondo Hatton. Only on Monster Monster Kid Radio. So, my friend, they uh, they come out with a story in uh, what was it? Was it Vanity Fair? The, the story came out in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep, Vanity Fair about the Warner Brothers uh, purchase by Discovery, and the article had some really interesting things. Uh, just a few of the little bites of information that that I plucked from that whole thing is Discovery's plans for DC, and that it seems like DC is a priority for the new CEO. Uh, they Discovery paid forty three billion dollars for Warner Media. And they are currently exploring overhaul, not of DC Comics, but of DC Entertainment, which includes DC Comics. And they're talking about turning DC into its own vertical business, kind of making it like they're they're in charge of their own thing. And they talked a little bit about uh, rather than licensing characters out for games and things like that, doing it all in-house. You know, you own the IP, own all the stuff that you're going to make with it. Well, that's what Marvel does, and it's worked. Exactly, exactly. And and the one comment I found was there were two comments I thought were very interesting. One was the new CEO has apparently made comments that he believes that the success of this merger is going to rest in a large part on unlocking the full potential of the DC Comics universe of characters. Thought that was a really interesting statement. And the other was that he thinks that they can find $3 billion in financial savings by taking advantage of some of the synergies and things. And, and whether that means an overhaul of leadership or combining some, some departments together, I don't know. But uh, it sounds like we're, we're maybe up for another shakeup. Well, okay, so it's all good news. I mean, it, it, the way they talk is at least, at least there's a, a, an interest. Because, I mean, the news before this was everybody was worried about what they were going to do with, with DC Entertainment, right? So, so this flips it on its head. So that's a, a plus side. The one thing I want to talk about, though, that I think is really, really an important topic is that, um, you know, it is being DC Entertainment making themselves a solidified content provider. So when and, and I want this noted, like whenever. So when I say, you know, it's worked for Marvel, it's not cop, it's not exactly copying Marvel. And, and I, I think and this needs to be stressed. I think it needs to be understood that this is using a certain business model that keeps things under an umbrella instead of having all these other outside sources pick at it and cause so much interference with it that it becomes discombobulated, you know? Kind of like how I feel the DC fandom is now. What you don't ever see out of Marvel, and this is always, this has always amazed me, is when is how hardcore DC fans are with this whole... God, I wish it would go away and die. Is the Snyderverse, you know, whether restore the Snyderverse, restore the Snyder, the ire cut, and all this other stuff. I mean, I understand there's a passion for it, and I love fans that that want to invest their time in that. But at the, you you need to understand. I mean, I understood this a long time ago, but it, that needs to go away. Like that, we need to break away from that, and we need to. And fans need to distance themselves from that kind of environment now, because I think everything has shifted, especially with this merger taking place, and especially with what they want to do moving forward. Because I think that's going to change the dynamics of things, and I really think that, it, that one thing that's going to be impacted is going to be Flashpoint. I have a feeling there's something that's going to come out of that Ezra Miller deal, unfortunately, and I don't know how far along the movie is. I would assume that they were done with it or close to being done. I don't. 
I don't know. But if if that's going to cause some problems with that character, and then you got this information that's flooding out, uh, it, I think I think it's a, it's a good chance you might see that next entirely and shift perspective on where they're going to go. Yeah, I I, I kind of think one of the comments I've heard them say is is that they feel that uh, DC has not got, DC Entertainment has not done a good job at Superman, and I think we would both agree with that. Yeah, I think we're going to see them start to go back and look at what are the iconic characters in the DC stable, and let's get them out there and build on that because that's the foundation, and and that means the original Big Seven. Yeah, so, I mean. You, you can go. You, the thing of it is, what what, what really, really, <laughs> what really, really blows my mind is, with how hot fandom is these days for nostalgia, you could come out with a, a golden age Justice League movie, and it would make a killing. It would make a killing. Have that old school feel to it. The old characters. I mean, you, you, tell me, tell me if I'm wrong. A Justice Society. Anything would be amazing and would probably do the fans would kill for it. Right, right. And and that's what I think a lot of these people are, are yearning for. I mean, a, a small nod in Thorne's book when they when the uh the costume, their their outfits came on and you know, and it was a harken back to the original Silver Age, Green Lanterns and stuff, you know. Fans love that stuff. I mean, if if anything, Marvel's excelled at that too. Look at what's look at look, look what they've done with Spider Man for crying out loud. You know, that that last Spider-Man movie was just, it wowed me in every way imaginable. And I don't even like Spider-Man just as much as I don't like Batman. <laughs> but the movie, I'm just sitting there thinking to myself, man, the way they write these things, the way they intertwine, the way they work these characters and do their stuff, that's what DC needs. And and then and it needs to fall under somebody who has an immense vision. Yeah. I, I, I've often felt like the difference between Marvel and DC when it comes to how they're dealt with in the movies and stuff is that Marvel has fully believed and fully let themselves get into whatever the concept of the character is mm-hmm. and go with it. Whether it's wackadoo crazy or, or silly or classic, they they go with it. You know, they lean in they lean into what the original design of the characters were because that's what made them popular. And look I think at, look at Moon Knight. This is right, one, right. Oh my God, that series is just stellar. Yeah, I. They, but they, but they, that's the thing. They allow their they allow their creative teams to explore those freedoms and those liberties to 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 create this kind of stuff. And I don't feel like Warner allows anything to matriculate or or just grow. I feel like they they constrain a lot of material. I always feel like Marvel looks at how can we pay homage to what this character is at its core. And DC is always like, well, what can we do to change this character to make it more hip? <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. And it's like, you know, we, we don't want to, we, I, I want to see the characters the way they, they came out on the printed page. I don't want you to change them. I don't want them to look different. I don't want them to, to, to be different. I want them to be what they are and what they've been for years and years and years and just changing them to meet a demographic I'm sorry. Maybe that maybe that doesn't feel inclusive to some audiences, but that's what those characters were. You can't change them and just make them something different, right? And yeah, what happens with the Flash movie and this whole thing with Ezra Miller that's going on? Man, I don't know. Uh, and the same with the Amber Heard and uh, the Aquaman two film. Yeah, I mean that's just I mean that's all noise and stuff that that just, that just hurts the industry. And it's like, I mean, I know you can't get away from celebrities doing what celebrities do. I mean, and I get it. But at the same time, like the accountability aspect of this whole social atmosphere is just, man, if when you become enemy number one, you become enemy number one. And it you can't take that target off your back. No, no. My, my, my hope for this merger is that the new CEO for this new company – looks at DC Entertainment and finally pulls them out from underneath the big toe of Warner Brothers because mm-hmm. a lot of the problems we've had with the movies hasn't been I know people like Jeff Johns has gotten a lot of a lot of negative publicity and so on but I I really blame the studios because the studio Warner Brothers still operates in this old school studio mentality 
that doesn't allow DC Entertainment to take risks because they know the characters. Let them tell the stories with the characters because they know how to. But right. don't walk in and dictate that, you know, the movie's got to be this much in length and and we want this and we want that and the other thing. And, and really put your thumbs down. And if you go back to the Ryan Reynolds Green Lantern movie, Ryan Reynolds wasn't the actor the director wanted, but they didn't let the director choose the actor. They imposed Ryan Reynolds on Martin Campbell. He didn't want him. And so you create tension on the set immediately. But the creative energies then get squashed. If I'm the director, I'm like, well, am I in control of this film or am I just making it for somebody else? Either either put me in charge of it or don't put me in charge of it. And I've always felt that DC Entertainment hasn't been able to drive the bus because they've been under the thumb of Warner Brothers. And if they mm-hmm. would just let them tell the stories the way they know, they know these characters better than anybody. Let them tell the stories. In you know, it's funny when we've seen some things succeed, it have been when Warner Brothers has backed off. Look at Peacemaker. Uh, look at the wackiness of this, the last Suicide Squad movie. Now, it didn't do gangbuster money in the movie, in the theaters, but it didn't bomb really either, as far as I know. Uh, look at the Aquaman film and, and look at the Shazam film, which was goofy and fun and all the things that, that you wouldn't normally see in a, a superhero film. I mean, Shazam was essentially big, meets the comic book industry. Well, and and I think and I think what a lot of fans don't really look at is Marvel has consistency. I mean, it doesn't matter what they're making; it's still it's still not only making them money. I mean, that goes without saying. But at the same time, even if there's a minimal amount or just a medium amount of criticism, it it's still it's still being produced and still being made, and it's still being eaten up by these fans. While at the same time, over on DC side. I mean, there's stuff's getting made, but it gets, it gets picked apart about everything, or it gets re- redone for this, or oh, look at the slate of movies they were supposed to have out by this point in time. If you look at that, if you look at that slate now of what it was then, I mean, ninety percent of it has been omitted. Right. I mean, it's gone. I mean, but that's just that Marvel has consistency. Oh, right. we're gonna do, we're gonna do six six episodes of this of this small character. You put six episodes out there and you see what bites. And I guarantee you this Moon Knight, nobody knows about this Moon Knight character. And, and, and I mean, they're hardcore fans do, right? But at the same time, not a lot of fandom knows, oh, I wonder who Moon Knight is. But you don't look at that series like, I don't. I wonder, I wonder who Moon Knight is. You look at that series because it's, it's, it's damn good. It's written well. And and they wow the, they wow the people that, that watch it because – Every series that Marvel does is it's unique and different in its own aspect, and it always fits and it works in with what they're storytelling, and how it and how it needs to develop. Right, and, and always fall and it falls under that Marvel Studios because I, I, it's in house. I feel like whenever I watch a Marvel product, I'm watching the character, the same character that was in the comics, because. Marvel understands the characters and what they are, what makes them popular. Whereas DC, it's somebody's interpretation. If somebody puts a spin on it, and I, I don't want to see it with somebody's spin on it. I want to see it. I want to see a new story told with the characters I love. Right. Uh, and and I think part of the big keys to to Marvel's success is having a leader like Kevin Feige, who's been there kind of as a guiding force and helping orchestrate things behind the scenes. And that's where DC Entertainment hasn't had that. I think they, they tried to let Jeff Johns do that, but they didn't really let him do that. They only half let him do it. Mm. And they still imposed their will and put him in a position of having to, to push their rules down. Mm. That, that he probably didn't believe it. I mean, we don't know that for a fact, but, I mean, you, you need to have somebody who's there to be that guiding force who lets the creators create, but helps guide them to keep them between the rails of what needs to happen. And I just think that's some of the things that they need. And what does this mean for Jim Lee? Is he going to still be the publisher? I don't know. Because I think as much as we're talking about the movie side of it, lacking direction and focus, I still feel like the comics are in the same boat. Yeah, I, I think you're right about that because I don't, I mean, I don't read a bulk of DC comics like I used to anymore. I've just, you know, I kind of threw in the towel with a lot of stuff because I didn't agree with a lot of things that they were doing. And, you know, to be quite honest with you, there's uh, there's some writers I'm just not interested in, in giving my time to. And there's others that I am, you know, unfortunately. Or, well, let's say it like this. Fortunately and unfortunately, <laughs> I've had to deal with a, a, this writer for the past 12 issues of a Green Lantern book. 
fortunately, we still talk about it because it's Green Lantern, and, <laughs> Green Lantern, and I love I love being on the podcast, and and that's the end of the day because it gives us something to do and talk about it. But you know, I we still have to deal with what what we're given, and you know, we may not like it, but we're going to ingest it all the same, right? All I can say is we we don't know what the future holds, obviously, but it looks like we're in for for some very very interesting times. And the fact that they believe that DC is very important to the success of this venture uh, means that it's going to get some attention, but it's also going to get put under a microscope. And some things are going to change. And some things, just like all change, some changes we're going to like, some changes we may not be thrilled about. But hopefully at the other end of the tunnel, we start getting the things that I think fans really deserve to see and seeing these properties really valued for what they are well at least you got somebody that's conscious enough of making these kind of statements because that shows that that shows that they care and and not only that i mean you got in what fans should also take from this before we move on to another you know to the some of our listener feedback is that if you're going to have a big corporation like this and this big merger that takes place and the ceo takes time to address these kind of topics, you know, that's when you know that at least the, the ship is going to go in a, in a good direction because it, at least, you know, there's a focus on it. He could have, he could have not said anything about DC at all. I mean, he could have not said nothing. I mean, he could have just said, well, we're going to continue to make movies as always. It's business as usual, blah, blah, blah. He took the time to focus on some issues that have been a topic of our conversations for well over a year now. You know, if not five, <laughs> well, <laughs> like, I mean, but at, at least at least he's put his thumb on those. And I think we can take some kind of solace from that. Yeah. So we'll 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 be paying close attention to what happens. Uh, hey, Phil, my power ring is blinking, which means we've got some listener feedback. So why oh. don't we pause and we'll come right back and hear what you guys have to say. What up, dweebs? This is Guy Gardner. You're listening to the podcast of OA. Green Lantern's Myron and Phil. We have a message from Corey who is writing about recently meeting artist Mike Crow. Transmitting message in 3, 2, 1. Hi, guys. I recently went to GalaxyCon in Richmond, Virginia because Mike Grell was signing autographs there. He signed a few items for me, and I got a sketch. We only talked for a few minutes but he was very nice and even took a photo with me. Have you guys ever met Mike Grell? If so, what was your experience? Also, I recently flew to Columbus, Ohio for a trip. I was the first from my group to arrive, so I took a cab to the closest local comic shop to kill some time. The shop was kind of small and didn't have a lot I needed, but I still wanted to get something to help the local comic shop. After milling around for a while, I found the new 52, Green Lantern Volume 3 The End Trade Paperback, which I didn't have. As I took a second cab from the comic shop to my hotel, it emerald dawned on me that I had just flown to Columbus and paid for two cab rides to pay full price for a Simon Bass story. As always, keep up the great work. Hey, Corey, thanks for reaching out. Good to hear from you. Hope everything is going good for you. Uh, Love the Mike Grell story. Uh, I've met Mike Grell at, I think it was the Baltimore Comic Con a couple of years ago when I was there. And I got I got him to uh, sign a book for me. It was really kind of cool because he was giving uh, certificates of authenticity. You could get those with it, with it so that you had proof that he had signed it and got a print from him. And he seemed like a really nice guy. So, yeah, I, I really like it. And I think it's funny that you, <laughs> you went all that way and got a yeah. Simon Baz book. That's pretty funny. That's a bummer. Man, I, I, I feel bad for you. I, I hope you're doing okay, Corey. You know, um <laughs> I know it can have some kind of post-traumatic stress that'll follow this. <laughs> if you need some help talking about it, let me know. I'm always here. You know, I'm, I'm, there's some relatable content here because I know what you're going through. And I know that shock feeling you probably got when you uh, when you realized it. It's just, oh, man. Well done, Corey. Well done, Corey. <laughs> now, 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 Phil, have you, ever, have you met Mike Grell? I have not met Mike Grell, no. Gotcha. I wish I could. I wish uh, there, I wish I met a lot more. I need to go to more Comic Cons. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever taken a plane t- trip somewhere to buy a Batman book or a Simon Bez book? Uh, you know, I, you know what I would do. I would I would take a plane ride straight to the bottom of the ocean to get away from a Simon Bez book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> Thanks a lot, Corey. It's great to hear from you. Uh, Powering, go ahead and play the next one for us. Thank you. The next message is from Thomas. He has some comments about DC Comics 5G initiative and the legacy of heroes. Transmission commences in 3, 2, 1. Hey Myron and Phil. I've really enjoyed your past couple of episodes of Retro Reviews. I was thinking about what Myron said about how DC is probably just trying to recoup any plans they can because of 5G and I don't understand why DC has to put all their eggs in one basket. I like the idea of the Justice League having their mantles passed to a new generation of heroes, but why must they make it the main focus? I wish if they move forward with it they could just put it in its own universe. Next to Green Lantern, I'm a huge Batman Beyond fan, but as much as I love that universe I don't need everything DC does to be beyond. On a lighter note, I have what I hope are a couple of fun questions. Phil, how is Clark doing? I feel like it's been months since we got a Clark update. How many GL outfits does he have now? And Myron, you've said you have been receiving your Green Lantern comics without paying so you can provide content for the podcast without voting for the book. Can you confirm or deny you are extorting your son to buy the book because of years of him using your Netflix in college? Thanks, Thomas. Good to hear from you. Uh, let's touch on some uh, one thing. Clark is doing absolutely stupendous. Um, kind of small caveat to that. He's kind of developing my 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 temperament and my nature, which isn't <laughs> probably the best thing. But as his my lovely wife likes to tell me, well, if he does that, that's you right there. He has a small little little temper tantrums and his little attitude and his little his little quirks, but he's working through it and I'm helping him work through it. But at the same time, I feel like such a hypocrite because I'm sitting there trying to <laughs> sit there and tell this kid, okay, well you can't do that, but it's okay. Cause I did it. And you know, <laughs> <laughs> but you're not supposed to do it, but let me tell you why I did it myself. And you know, but, uh, every, everybody, everybody's doing great over here, Thomas. And, um, uh, thanks for asking. I know I haven't, uh, I haven't mentioned him a lot in a while and, I don't know why days carry on and he's growing like a weed. So I'm looking forward to spending the summer with him. But, uh, yeah, as far as, far as, uh, DC putting all their eggs in one basket, I, they don't, they shouldn't have to put all their eggs in one basket. And, um, as far as, uh, uh, recouping from their, I guess he's talking about the five G plans, right? Uh, I, th- I think what they're doing is, is it has five G in it. I don't. I don't think that should let that fool you. I seriously doubt that you can wipe out an entire plan like that and and develop something new without keeping what was initially there or some fragments of it. I, I have a feeling that there's a lot of elements of 5G in this. It's just been rebranded. I I agree. I I think that there was a lot of energy and money spent to develop the 5G thing, and they're not just going to throw it out. Yeah. Um. For me. I know I'm going to sound like the old man. I know I am. But I don't believe in legacy. I, I don't think that that is a great thing for comics. I think, I mean, look at Book Rogers and Flash Gordon. There's no, you know, we're not reading about their kids or their protégés. They're still around in the form that they've existed in for years and years and years. I don't want to read about Sherlock Holmes' grandkid. Sorry. Uh, so for me, the DC Universe, I would rather stick. They don't need, these characters don't need to age along with us. And if we want to do an like, like he mentions, for example, Batman Beyond. I think Batman Beyond is great, but it does it isn't set in our universe, and that's what the multiverse is for. So I don't want to see twenty five Robins that have existed over the years, but Batman still be the same age he's always been. Uh, it just creates nothing but, 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 but convoluted plows. But that's just my well, two cents. Well, not only that, you have so many different characters. I mean, you know, this will touch on the the small point about the Superman movie that's that they're rumored to be producing with you know with Val Zod. You know, it's worth noting that Val Zod Superman is from a different Earth. So you're again, you're touching into the multiverse concept, but your everyday fan is gonna is gonna know that that's not the original Superman. You know, and this gets back to the point about the Green Lantern Alan Scott thing when he came out as being gay a long time ago, and it was all over the news, and it was oh my gosh, Green Lantern's gay, Green Lantern's gay. Okay, well, number one, who cares? I mean, that's great and it's fine, but it, I don't think it should be exploited in that manner. Number two. It's not just Green Lanterns, okay? It's Alan Scott. Keep that in mind, and it's also Alan Scott from Earth Two. You know, let's put let's put a let's put a name on this. You know, don't just say Green Lanterns gay. I mean, that's just. I'm sorry. That's. I think that's disrespectful to the character. 
but um, I don't want to go too far off the point, but but I, I agree with with my, with Myron on some stuff. I, I don't I don't like the legacy characters. I don't I don't I don't like 500 million of these other characters around. I just think there's too many of them. You can have a Flash family is cool. The Green Lantern Corps is awesome, and you can have a, a multitude of you know like you know, the Superman family, you know Supergirl, you know Superboy or whatnot. Uh, but I just I think there's there's a lot going on with a lot of these characters now and especially when you start you know talking about the, the shows on the CW and then you got the big screen stuff and you start and you get separation anxiety because you got the flash over here flash over there well why is that flash in the movie and that flash on TV I mean the guy on TV is a lot better than the guy in the movie and they didn't put him in there <laughs> you know well, this goes on you got it sometimes you got to pull in the reins and I, and I hope that with this merger it'll do that and some and Hopefully it'll fix it. Maybe address some of the stuff you're talking about. Right, and and no, I, I did not extort my son to get copies of the book. <laughs> um, <laughs> my son would have to have a job for that to happen. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, I'll tell you, year, <clears throat> several years ago, <clears throat> during the Robert Venditti run and through the Morrison run, uh, I had a. a, a person who uh, was I knew who was very kind of down on their luck and couldn't really afford comics. And so I was buying extra copies for that individual uh, person now has a job. And so I had told him, I, you know, I'm not buying this. And he's like, well, you know, I'm a completionist. I want to continue with it. So he did. So I've been able to read books <clears throat> without having to buy them. So th that's how that's how, how you do it, you know. But anyway, we've got one more message. This is for our good friend Ken. So Power Ring, why don't you go ahead with the transmission? Our final message is a voice recording from Ken. He has some questions about Green Lantern to pose to you. Playback of transmission begins in three, two, one. Hi, Myron Phil. This is Ken. Thank you for answering my emails. It's a lot of fun to hear you guys talk about Green Lantern. And if you ever want to invite fans to come on the show, let me know. I would love to discuss GL concepts and ideas with you both. So I have two questions for you. My first one, and this was challenging for me, what if you could only have three Lander cores? This doesn't have to be restricted to the seven main emotional spectrum cores, but it's up to you. Members of the other cores can join the ones you keep. Personally, my first choice is pretty standard with the Green Lander core, the Sinestra core, and the Star Sapphires, since they are the foundation of the emotional spectrum, in my, in my opinion. So my other choice is more Elseworlds with the blue, yellow, and red lanterns. It would be interesting to see how fear, hope, and rage define the emotional spectrum, and since they are primary colors, I would imagine wearing two at the same time would cause combinations, secondary, secondary colors like green, orange, and purple, will, avarice, and compassion, which would be weaker and harder to control. And my second question is, with DC introducing John Kent, Danny Wayne, Andy Curry, and Irie West, what if one of the human lanterns had to have a child? Who would you choose? I know there's technically Ty Pham and Kelly, but still. Personally, I would like Kyle and Jay to have a kid, disregarding how their relationship ended. But I think it would be interesting if they introduced Guy's son. Seeing Guy be a father after everything that happened between him and his father would be a great opportunity for Guy to grow and mature. And it would be interesting to see how Guy's son interacts with the core and the league with Guy's reputation on the line, you know. And I don't think it would be completely surprising if Guy had a illegitimate kid up there, but, you know. So, yeah, thank you again for your awesome show, and, yeah, have a great day. Bye. Hey, Ken, thanks for the voicemail. Uh, dude, we, we love having people on the show. We haven't done one of those. Well, we, we did it for a lot over the pandemic. <laughs> we, we, took, we took the liberty of trying to record as much as possible and just getting callers to come in and get on the show, but... We haven't done one of those in a while, so you know that'd, that'd be cool to readdress that and, and spin around and come back to you, Ken. Um, well, let's see. You asked some interesting questions, so let me see if I can answer them. Uh, what human lantern would I want to have a kid? Um, I think I would have to say Kyle. I think I think Kyle with a kid would be really really cool. I mean, I know you said because I think you talked about. Jade, right? Jaden. Guy Gardner having it. He, his God. idea was for Guy Gardner to have a child and give him a chance to grow. Right. Uh, I, I'd like to see Kyle. I think he'd be. I think he'd be a cool dad. And I think he's he's fun, you know. And uh, I, I just I don't. I think John Stewart would also be kind of 
unique in that role, but I really, I don't, I don't know if I can answer why. I just picture it. Um, and as far as the land, the the um, the land, the cores go. Let's see. We're talking about the. If there can only be three core, which three would you want? Three cores. Oh gosh. I mean, if I pick the obvious, it's going to be green. But who else do I throw in there with them? I mean, I I, I love Brother Warth and I love the Hope. Um, but I don't know if I love them enough to just put them in there. So I'm just going to. Like the, the, the black count because black hand. Sure. You know. Yeah. Yeah. They okay. Count. So I'm gonna go with Green Lantern Core. I'm gonna go with the Black Lantern Core, and then I'm gonna go with the Orange Lantern Core. Which that makes it easy because then you know, I got the Green Lanterns, and then I got Black Hand and Larflees, and a bunch of constructs and dead people. <laughs> that's, that's a winning formula right there. I can't believe. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I for me, if if I wanted to see a, a human lantern have a child, I I really would like to see Hal and Carol have Martin Jordan as his son. Oh. But my spin would be for Martin to be selected to be a yellow lantern, and how Ooh. Hal would deal with it. That's pretty good, man. That'd be a good start. That'd be a good story. Because he'd have to be mentored by his uncle Sinestro, so that would be pretty interesting to me. Uh, but but I do like his idea about Guy Gardner as well. That's pretty cool. Uh, yeah. In terms of three core, I I agree with Ken. If you know if I were picking it, I think green, yellow, and the star sapphires make the most sense because they're the original ones, and there's so much history there. But if I wanted to, if I wanted to shake it up, I think I I, I kind of like the idea of a white lantern, like he said, being able to channel all the different colors, and I would temper that against the red and the yellow. I think that would be interesting. I, I've always felt like. There's a missed opportunity for a story in that the way the central power batteries were supposed to work was that all of the will of the universe gets collected in the central power battery, and that's what you tap off of. And the same with all the other emotions. So mm-hmm. I've always felt like, well, that's not an infinite resource, really, when you think about it, because there's only so many beings in the universe. And how do they feel is going to temper what kind of energy they create, which is going to be absorbed by their central battery. So to me, I've always felt it would be really interesting if, for example, uh, the Sinestro Corps really did a good job of spreading fear. So they got more yellow energy into the power batteries, which meant that hope and will would lose energy. And so they'd have to start to be careful because they don't have as much energy to spend as a core. And so you'd have this whole, you know, the, the, the spectrum is is a representation of the feelings of the universe. And so how do these beings of kind of the more nefarious emotions, how do they manipulate people to generate more energy? And how does that weaken the, the stronger emotions? I always thought that would be kind of interesting. but I mean, that really would be a, a unique take, too, because you're, you're talking about you're talking about somebody that has an entirely different emotional feel like. It's something, well, you could look at it like this. It's something simple as in if somebody's uh, really, really mad and in a rageful mood and then, but love comes along and tries to temper that, you know, how's that reaction feel, you know, especially when you're, when you're, when you're, when it's so large, like you were talking about um, the, the spread of it, you know, so if you got one person that, that loves is trying to fight a hundred of rage. I mean, that's, that. It sounds like a unique story arc. That'd be kind of cool. It could, it could be interesting. It could be interesting. Yeah. Um, and you could fall into a trap really easy too, but I think it would be interesting. But Ken, I appreciate you doing a voicemail. That was great. Uh, and and for for those that want to participate, we'll, we'll have the power ring tell you how you can be a part of the show. But when you do a voicemail, you can do it in up to one minute segments. And what we did for Ken was he had three different sections that were a minute long each. And I just kind of edited them all together into one voicemail. So you can chunk it up if you have a longer piece of commentary but we'd love to hear from from anybody and everybody who wants to talk about their love of green lantern so powering why don't you go ahead and tell everybody how they can be a part of the show and then we'll be back to wrap things up you can become a part of the show by leaving a message up to one minute long on our voicemail line call us at 406 pot of oa that's 406-763-6362 you can also email us at podcast at block of oa.com We'd love to hear from you. All right, man. Here we are. 12 issues down. It's an end of a year of Green Lantern, basically. I think we both deserve Purple Hearts. (laughs) I think we do. (laughs) 
<laughs> I think you're right. We we struggled. We made it through. We had to deal with Simon and all the Batman, all the Batman news. But uh, we made it. We're here. I guess next up is Dark Crisis, right? Right, right. And we don't know when we're going to have another Green Lantern book. So we're going to have to go back to the well and look at some old stuff, which which I'm excited for because. After this last year, the old stuff is looking better and better and better. <laughs> no, yeah, I totally agree. I want to go back to the Jeff Johns. I mean, we, we need to go way back to that. Absolutely. I already miss it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my friend. Well, it's been good talking to you again, as always. All right. And uh, tell the wife we said hey. Will do. So, hey, everybody out there, until next time. Take care of each other, keep that power ring charged, and make every day your brightest day. The Podcast of Oa is the official podcast of the Blog of Oa and a proud member of the Comics Podcast Network. Share your comments and questions by calling the show's voicemail line at 406 Pod of Oa. That's 406 763 6362. You can send your emails to podcast at blogavoa.com. You can also find the Blog of Oa and the Podcast of Oa on Twitter and Facebook. Green Lantern and other related characters are the copyrighted property of DC Comics Incorporated and are used without permission. The Blog of Oa and the Podcast of Oa are fan productions and do not claim any ownership over the Green Lantern or any other copyrighted properties.